did not. You just have to double click on that and it should bring you right up. Now I gotta look for the mayors because okay. we're all here for space for Those are off there too. messing with my chair, some big guy. You used to sit here. You and the, the chair was on the floor. <laughs> okay. We're almost set. We had an executive session, so we're just a little trying to catch up here. Get things in order. I think we're Meetings call to order. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for our invocation. Pastor Forrest from Fountain Hills Christian Center is with us tonight. Thank you so much. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, I thank you for the privilege we have of living in this fine community and for these leaders we have. And Lord, we ask that you would continue to bless our efforts to live in this environment and to care for each other. Lord, I, I pray a special blessing on our law enforcement workers this evening. Lord, they serve so faithfully in so many ways, and we thank you for the unseen protection that we take for granted so many times. I pray your blessings on them, Lord. And I ask that you would guide this council, its decisions made, and may we give you glory in your name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Todd. Roll call, please, Beth. Mayor Kavanaugh. Here. Councilmember Brown. Here. Councilmember DePorter. Here. Councilmember Hansen is absent. Councilmember Yates. Present. Councilmember Magazine. Here. And Councilmember Lachey. Okay, first order of business is a proclamation for the 41st anniversary of the Polish American Congress, declaring the month of October 2015 as Polish Heritage Month in the town of Fountain Hills. Whereas the citizens of the city of Zamosh, Poland, in the town of Fountain Hills, Arizona, USA, formed a sister city relationship in June of 2014 and are committed to a partnership that promotes peace and prosperity through people-to-people -people exchanges and citizen diplomacy. And whereas a delegation from the town of Fountain Hills traveled to Zamosh, Poland to officially establish the sister city relationship and witness firsthand the beauty, culture, architecture, and hospitality of Poland. And whereas the town of Fountain Hills recognizes the valuable contributions made by its distinguished citizens and town employees who are of Polish heritage. And whereas Polish Americans throughout the state of Arizona and throughout the United States of America have a deeply rooted commitment to the values of family, faith, democracy, hard work, and fulfillment of the American dream. Now, therefore, I, Linda M. Cavanaugh, Mayor of the Town of Fountain Hills, Arizona, do hereby proclaim the town's recognition of the 41st anniversary of the Polish-American Congress of Arizona and the town's further recognition of the month of October 2015 as Polish Heritage Month. Thank you. I see Sharon Morgan's here from Sister Cities. Thank you for joining us, uh, Mayor Sharon Morgan. Okay, and now we have next order of business. Usually I give a EDC report, but 
since we have so much to do today, I'm going to postpone that until next week. The only thing I do want to announce is um, I was honored that my peers, who are the other mayors who sit in the Maricopa Association of Governments Regional Council, re-elected me uh, to a two-year term to um, represent the East Valley. So I was very honored that, that I got that reappointment. Um, recognition of Mayor's Youth Council. Okay, I've got, uh, you look up on the slide there, you will see three of our mayors, okay, three of, uh, three of our ma my Mayor's Youth Council members. Um, we have Peter Bogdan, Kyle Clark, and Anthony Bogdan, and the two Bogdans are the sons of Beata Bogdan, who works in Town Hall, and um, at the League Conference in Tucson, these three boys attended uh, the youth part of the League Conference, and we also had them carry down our town flag uh, to open the conference. Um, I thought that it would be nice to have our youth do it instead of me, and they certainly did it very proudly. The whole town would be very proud of these three young men. And I will let Councilman DePorter take this one. I had the opportunity to have, sit down and have lunch with those three gentlemen, and they far surpassed um, a lot of 16 and 15 and 16 year olds that I've ever met as far as maturity goes. So, and they, they really enjoy the time that they have spent at the Mayor's Youth Council and how they're involved in town. Um, they're just fantastic individuals and we're, we're hoping to, um, ASU is gonna be hosting hopefully the Mayor's Youth Council this fall for a nice tour of, of campus and encourage them to come our way for school. So great, great students. Mm -hmm. And the last just shows from Fountain Hills, um, Senator Kavanaugh and myself, the three boys, and Heather Ware, who is not only our volunteer coordinator, but she also uh, coordinates the Mayor's Youth Council, and she does a fantastic job. Okay, and that's, um, and that's it. I just wanted to bring that out to show these, these three young men, and also to thank Heather for driving them and getting them up at 5 a.m. to drive to Tucson on that day, and then she drove them back herself. So she did an awful lot to make this happen. Our next is a presentation of the 2015 My Republic Rewards Community Grant Award by Republic Services Division Manager Robert Bennett. Grady, did you want to start? Yes, I'd just like a few words um, about this program. You recall a few years ago we began contracting with um, Republic Services for our sanitation services here in town. We went from multi uh, haulers to one uh, hauler for the town. And this, as part of this program that we have with this hauler, Republic Services, uh, we have a recycling program where the recycling that is collected generates some revenue and they, the company actually gives that money back to the community. And, and this is one of the ways that they do it is through the uh, My Republic Rewards Community Grant Award program. And I'd like to call upon Republic Services Division Manager Robert Bennett to come up and give a little bit of a slideshow presentation and to present the award. Thank you, Grady, appreciate it. Welcome, Bob. Great to be here again. Mm -hmm. Let me get into this. So thank you, Mayor Kavanaugh, council members. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to come and present again. So this will be my second year here. Um, and I wanted to be very specific today uh, in our presentation because we're talking about the Republic Rewards Program and our recycling program here in Fountain Hills. So uh, as you know, we've been here since 2011. Um, and just from a, a scope standpoint, in that time, almost 30,000 tons of waste have been collected and a little bit over seven tons of recycling. So you can do the math on that. Um, wanted to cover, uh, you know, our relationship with uh, the town 
Um, one of the great things about my job is the ability to come into a community where you really get to see the atmosphere of a community. And this is really a special one. And I get to go all over the valley. I started in Buckeye today, ended up at Queen Creek, and now I'm here. Um, but, you know, here's a couple things that we support. Um, you know, Fourth at the Fountain, Oktoberfest, Turkey Trot. I may run this year. We'll, we'll see. My, my knees are getting a little bit better. Um, but, uh, you know, this is the fun part. And, and, and the rewards program is definitely part of this. Um, and this year, from a recycling standpoint, we got to do something a little bit different that I haven't gotten to do in other communities, and that was provide some recycling containers uh, in, in the park. And this actually started with the mayor. Um, we had a meeting, and she kind of brought up that, you know, hey, we've got this great recycling program we're doing with residents, and we have this beautiful park, but we didn't have any recycling receptacles there. So we were able to find uh, a product that would go out there, be easy to service for the, for the folks that service that so we could start increasing our recycling. And it was a great partnership in being able to work together to increase that, that diversion rate. And we thank you for those free. <laughs> yep. And, and I'm cheap, so that doesn't happen very often. Um, but, you know, here's, here's the point of it and the, and the good news. Um, for those of you guys who keep up with, with the news and what's going on with maybe a very large city to the west of us, you know, they've got some very aggressive diversion goals, and, and as of right now, so far this year, um, the town of Fountain Hills is almost at 26% diversion. That big city west of us is at half of that. So you guys should be proud of yourselves, and the residents should be proud of themselves for what they're doing because they really are stretching out the length of these landfills and doing the right things by the environment. So it's something to be proud of. Uh, as we talked about, the uh, Republic Rewards Program is an incentive program to increase that diversion. And uh, this is now the third year, I believe, that we, we've had this. Actually, the second year, excuse me. Last year was the first one. But what was exciting about this year is I saw a, a, a level of excitement that just really jumped off, off the table. Um, last year, our votes were a little bit over 600,000. This year, it was almost 1.3 million. Okay. And, and, and I hear laughing in the we background because we were that. talking earlier. Um, that has to do with uh, the winner. Um, but in addition to that, the, the program itself, the, re the, the registration rate, you know, went up by uh, almost 5%. So we have more people participating, which is great. Um, and the engagement, more importantly, was at 50%. Um, for these types of programs, getting 50% of residents anywhere to participate in something is pretty amazing. So it's something to be proud of. We had five projects that participated this year, the River of Time Museum, uh, Experience Fountain Hills, Fearless Kitty Rescue, uh, Fountain Hills Botanical Garden, and the Kiwanis Club of Fountain Hills. So not that we couldn't tell who the winner is. <laughs> um, without further ado, uh, the winner this year is the Fearless Kitty Rescue. So we doubled the number of votes this year. Unbelievable. <clears throat> 524,000 of the 600,000 more went to this team back here. And so I was hearing, you know, little bits and pieces, and we were talking uh, a little bit earlier, um, of sitting outside of, uh, outside of Tractor Supply, talking to residents and building, uh, you know, excitement for the program. So, you know, this is, this is fun because they earned it, and some. And uh, I'm very proud to be able to present a check to you. In just a second, I'll, I'll call you up, but I, I do want to say thank you uh, to Fearless Kit Kitty Rescue. They do great service. I was all over the internet kind of looking at some of the things they're doing today, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's nice to see that somebody who's working hard trying to do the right thing benefit from a program like this. So uh, great job, guys, and thank you. Mm -hmm. um, as I finish up, uh, it would be remiss of me not to talk about the overall service and at the end of the day who's really the most important part of our team, uh, and that's our drivers. You know, those of us who, you know, put the suits on and the leather shoes every day, yeah, we work hard, but it, these are the guys that are out in the 100-degree weather picking up the trash and recycling every single day. Rain, shine, dust storm, it doesn't matter. They're out there doing it. And so I just want to highlight, uh, you know, Joe Chapman, uh, Keith Swafford, uh, Louis Sanchez, uh, Ron Haggard, and Steve Mendoza, uh, which together make up about 75 years of trash experience between the five of them. Um, 
same drivers. We don't have any turnover out here. They love coming out here. They love the community. So I've got to say thank you to these guys and recognize them every single day and every time I see them because they're the ones that really do the real work. So thanks, guys. And uh, Kitty Rescue, if you could come up here. Let's get some pictures. Thank you. Linda, let me see. My, I've got a kitty. I got two dogs. My, no, my, my kids are working me hard now. I was just saying. No, I know that trick. I know that trick. Thank you, you guys. That's what it is. Clicking like crazy. That's how you get them. I didn't know our population was that large. Jeez. I, 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 I think so. I think somebody has been in 12 or 2. Mayor? And they're all up for adoption, and there's a lot more where they came from. <laughs> and, and if you go on their website, they're also starting a cat cafe on Sundays where you can go in and have a cup of coffee and pet the cats. So. Check out their website. They're doing more and more. Thanks for coming, Bob. Thank you. And thanks for the money. <laughs> hey, Bob, don't leave. Bob, don't. Alan wants, uh, Councilman Magazine wants to say something. Uh, I want to, well, I want to thank and congratulate Kitty Rescue, even though they've all left, but um, for what they do for the community. But I want to say a word or two about Republic. Um, the first slide said that it was a public-private partnership. And it really is a partnership. Um, I couldn't be more impressed. Uh, the work you people do, your involvement in the community, uh, really should serve as a model for lots of other businesses. Um, and I don't think you get, uh, because of what you do, you probably don't get a lot of praise. Um, you probably get a lot of uh, bad phone calls if it isn't, if trash isn't picked up right on time or something. Uh, but I really am impressed by your entire operation. Uh, there have been times when I'll walk out uh, to the front and just by accident the trucks are coming along and we wave to each other, they're friendly, uh, they're accommodating. Um, sometimes I could be a little late and I'm wheeling it down the driveway and they stop and they wait. Um, I've just, I just can't say enough about, uh, about the company, about the service, about the people. And, and as far as our recycling cans, we do thank you for that. And you didn't tell the whole story of how you didn't have any cans and you actually went out and purchased them for us and then didn't charge us. And now they're all in our, in our park and everybody's using them and it's just great. So we really thank you. Does anyone else have anything to say? Otherwise, we'll say thanks, Bob. Thanks for coming. Thank you so much. Okay. Pick up a kitty on your way. <laughs> All right. It's always nice when we do that fun stuff. Okay. Presentation of the tourism program with a forecast of 
FY16 projects and priority items by Recreation Supervisor Rachel and Tourism Coordinator Grace. Start with Grady. Yes, just a few words. Um, essentially, we took over um, doing economic development uh, roughly in January of 2014, I believe. And since that time, um, things have been going very well. Um, we have an, an excellent team that are able to really do a lot with the limited resources that we have. And with us tonight um, are both Recreation Supervisor uh, uh, Rachel Goodwin and Tourism Coordinator Grace Rodman uh, Getter. And uh, they're going to basically go over what they've accomplished in the short period of time that they've been here and also where we're going. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Rachel. Thanks, Grady. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you for having us back again. Uh, Grace and I are here, just like Grady said, to offer our semi-annual update on the tourism efforts. Uh, tonight's update will cover some broad stroke tourism statistics for the entire state. Um, it'll review of several highlights of our local tourism efforts over the last six months. And then lastly, it'll introduce some of our new initiatives that we're hoping to cover in the next upcoming six months. So with that, I'm actually going to ask Grace to do our presentation this evening. Good evening, Mayor Kavanaugh, members of the council. All right, just like uh, Rachel said, we're going to provide you with an update. Let's get started. Uh, so this past summer, for the second year in a row, Rachel and I had the opportunity to attend the Governor's Conference on Tourism, which is hosted by the Arizona Office of Tourism this year. Um, and with that, they provided us with some very hard and fast statistics about tourism in the state, this year being particularly important because of hosting the Super Bowl this past year. And so they were able to provide us with the statistics you see here, which are a true reflection of tourism in the state, both with high impact events like the Super Bowl, but what that also means economically. So uh, for the statewide report for fiscal year 2014, they provided us the uh, 40.7 million domestic and international uh, overnight visitors were generated by the tourism industry. That was up 4.1% from 2013. Uh, there was also direct travel spending generated in the amount of $20.9 billion. Uh, there were $57 million contributed to Arizona's economy each and every single day, especially during this high peak season of the Super Bowl. Uh, $2.8 billion in federal, state, and local tax revenue was generated by direct travel, and they estimate that those travelers spend up to 2.8% uh, over 2013. So tourism as an industry as a whole is incredibly important to the state of Arizona and what economic drivers we have statewide. Uh, with that being said, uh, we have one of many uh, wonderful announcements we'd like to share with you tonight. Um, through the grant process, the Arizona Office of Tourism has granted us an estimated amount of $26,658.55 in grant monies to our tourism division here. We are incredibly ecstatic about Thank you. Um, with those monies that were allocated to us, we have a plan to um, spend them as such here. Uh, Fountain Hill specific inset in the Phoenix area map, which has already been uh, published last week. We have started to distribute that already. Uh, we look to purchase ad space in Phoenix Magazine, advertising in Playball spring training publication during spring training season. We're looking into a golf hole sponsorship at the Waste Management Open. How wonderful would it be as you're putting across the green to see a hole sponsored by the town of Fountain Hills. Uh, we're looking to have four months of online digital retargeting with a company called Vici Media. Uh, production of the official visitor's guide, which we of course do annually, that is due to be published again in November. Along with a 60 second promotional video introducing the town to the tourism industry, to the state, to the region, and just in 60 seconds showcasing what we're all about. And, as if we have to explain it, but all of the wonderful reasons why you should come here to Fountain Hills. 
Uh, we've also been very fortunate to receive some industry awards. As you can see, we have them placed here as well as a few uh, snapshots Rachel and I took in the merriment of, of the moment. But uh, we received the 2015 Community Neighborhood Special Event Award for populations under 25,000 in residence uh, for the event Slide the City. This was from the Arizona Parks and Recreation Association. Um, and for these photographs, we're also fortunate from the same Parks and Rec Association to win first place in photography for this shot of the fountain. Note the bike. Okay. <laughs> and we received second place for this shot of the basketball courts, really emphasizing what Parks and Recreation means to not only uh, the Arizona Association, but what it means for our town. We're such an active, vibrant, outdoor community, and for us to not only facilitate ourselves that way, but market ourselves that way opens so many doors, and I think it really strengthens our community. Uh, the town of Fountain Hills was also recognized for the fifth time in a row as being a playful city from the Humana Foundation, sponsored by Kaboom. Again, it, it falls right in line with those outdoor initiatives being active and, well, being a playful city. Uh, let's discuss tourism as a brand. Rachel and I have been working uh, very diligently to market Fountain Hills and to make sure that we have Im an image that we are not only proud of, but one that we feel is, I like to use the term, truthful. So when you see this photograph, that is what our beautiful park looks like. And that's how we want to show ourselves uh, to the world, to the tourism industry, as to why you should visit Fountain Hills. So our 2015 marketing message for this year is get out of the valley and into the hills. As far as advertising goes, this is a snapshot of our advertising designs campaigns for this year. We are using that same tagline, get out of the valley and get into the hills. Once again, you see this beautiful picture of the bike and the fountain really facilitating this community culture that we have. Uh, we tell folks, we could tell you about our neighborhood restaurants, our hidden adventures, and our small town charm, our stunning views, but come see for yourself. We'll save you a seat. Uh, with these advertising uh, designs that we've come up with, we have partnered with Madden Media, the Arizona Office of Tourism, Phoenix Magazine, and Vici Media to feature this photography, this marketing message, and this image as we move forward with branding Fountain Hills. For the 18th month assessment, as Grady mentioned earlier, tourism has been housed under the town for the past 18 months. And I just want to touch base with you for a moment about what has happened uh, in those 18 months, but more specifically in the last six months since our last update. So we have continuing with the branding of Fountain Hills using the tagline, Experience Fountain Hills. It's a very specific call to action. We would love for people to come and experience Fountain Hills. The implementation of a strategic marketing strategy, design and implementation of new and existing publications, continuing revitalization of tourism programs, we facilitate stakeholder meetings, presentations, and outreach incentives, online advertising, as well as brand exposure throughout the Valley. For publications, when we last uh, spoke, we were revitalizing the official visitor's guide as well as the dining guide. I just want to let you know the, dis the distribution rates in the past year. We have distributed uh, over 17,000 visitor's guides statewide and regionally. We also we send them through Sky Harbor International Airport, Mesa Gateway Airport. We also have a few connections in California as well as hotels and CVBs throughout the state. We've also distributed over 4,000 dining guides. We use all of this collateral at every special event that we table at, as well as our distribution connections. But what does this really mean? How do we make this happen? Rachel and I have, between amongst ourselves, coined the term boots on the ground, and that's the cornerstone we believe in for making this happen, which means that when you go to a special event, you see Rachel and myself handing out the collateral, speaking with people at special events, catering to their questions and their needs, really promoting the town. We personally collect data results, which we'll discuss later in the presentation. We do all of our in-house printing to make sure that our collateral is up to date and that we always have the quantities we need 
for distribution. We're making connections. We're talking with people. We're letting them know that there's not just a program, but there's a face, there's an email, there's a phone number. There is a people that you can speak to who hear you loud and clear and are working diligently on this program. Uh, we also do all of our own in-house website updates, making sure that everything is as up-to-date as absolutely possible. Let's jump into analytics, which is always my absolute favorite. <coughs> the graphs just make me happy. Uh, so who is our audience? The average age of our followers um, in 2014 uh, as far as our social media outlets go, we are 59% male followers, 41% female followers for Twitter. Um, the, quite a switch for Facebook that is very heavy on the female side was 71%. As you can see, our main age ranges are in between the ages of 25 and 44. So we're reaching that very, coming into affluence, that very active age range who really want to get out there and do something when they want to have experiences, they want to hike, they want to bike, they want to be a foodie and, and, and try everything. So we're reaching that key demographic. Um, these are the impressions that we also make by gender. Again, very heavy on the females with 63%, but staying in that age range of 25 to 44. Who do we reach online? Uh, primarily, we are targeting folks in Mesa, Phoenix, Scottsdale, Fountain Hills, of course, and Tempe. Uh, those are our regional neighbors. They're the folks who make the most sense for those who are most likely to visit us on the day-to-day. -day. And as always, I, I've said this before, I'll say it again, online rules the world. It truly is the, the trend for how things are moving. Um, where do we stand? What's, what's our audience and engagement reach? The impressions for our page on any given week are 78,000 impressions. There is no limitation online. You know, you can only talk to so many people in a day face to face, but when you take the time to market appropriately online, it is limitless, and that's evident here when we reach almost 100,000 people. So tourism impact studies, as I mentioned earlier, Rachel and I collect surveys in person at special events. And here are some survey results from a few special events we attended this past season. Slide the City visitors came from 21 different zip codes, including Scottsdale, Greater Phoenix, and Litchfield. Over 31% had a party of five or larger. 33% spent more than $100 on the day of the event and over 50% heard about the event through social media channels. Ticket sales, there were 506 single slider transactions, over 1,400 triple slider transactions, and over 1,200 VIP slider transactions. That was a very successful event reaching a large amount of people. For Fourth at the Fountain, our Fourth of July event, our impact studies showed us the following. Out of 179 surveys collected, visitors came from a total of 18 different zip codes, uh, the top three zip codes being Fountain Hills, Phoenix, and Scottsdale. 16% indicated that they were new visitors, 44% reported spending between $20 and $50, and over 30% heard about the event through social media channels. Hotels here in town, um, the Inn at Eagle Mountain and the Lexington Report Lexington Resort reported having at least a 90% occupancy rate on the 4th of July. So where do we go from here? We're, we're running with this momentum that, that we're building. Uh, Rachel and I are looking to continue our marketing efforts in the way of continuing to advertise on Facebook, online advertising with TripAdvisor, ad placements in Phoenix Magazine, uh, we're continuing to have listings in the Arizona Office of Tourism Guides. Um, updating our webs we are looking to update our website, website to keep up with industry standards, researching tools to maximize user-friendly look and feel. We are also looking to the implementation, implementation of itineraries, kind of drawing out for people all of the top things that they should do in Fountain Hills. We're also categorizing them by different themes. If you're into outdoor recreation, if you're a foodie, if you're into arts and culture, we want to 
create a pre-planned itinerary for you. So if you say to yourself, I've never been to Fountain Hills, I'm not sure what, what I should do. I'll tell you all the fabulous things you should do. So our new online marketing and retargeting campaign, we are working with a company called Vici Media. And they will help us implement geo-tracking, call tracking, as well as online ad retargeting. So we've created an ad set that we will be serving to people online to further incentivize them to visit Fountain Hills. We're also creating industry relationships. We have a stakeholder meeting scheduled for the beginning of September in which we will discuss common goals initiatives. We are working on outreach with neighboring CVBs, visiting local businesses, and interacting with business owners in order to promote our program. Connections is what is most important, and we take that very seriously. With that being said, before I jump into questions, I'll invite Rachel to join me as we have one more wonderful piece of news to announce today. Uh, Rachel and I found out that the Salt River Pima Nation has awarded us another $25,000 grant. That's outstanding. And I had lunch today with President Ray and personally thanked him and assured him that we will use that money wisely. Absolutely. <laughs> and he's We're, very excited about our new relationship. We're incredibly grateful and so that's excited. Uh -huh. And that's as much as we asked for, and we got exactly what we asked for, which is really, really outstanding. And this presentation is outstanding, and what you've done as far as awards and grants, and you didn't mention the new Art Walk brochure, which I know that the, um, the Art Committee is very excited about. Oh, and good. it certainly is a wonderful new brochure to add to everything else. Thank you. Yes, the, the brochure will be coming out soon. It's still in its infancy draft stages. Um, and as Rachel just mentioned to me, our new banners went up yesterday along the avenue. All right. So here we go. On, <laughs> on to new horizons. Anybody have any questions? Or, yeah. Thanks, Thanks, Mayor. Thanks. First Lady, tremendous, tremendous job. I know your huge department of two, <laughs> you guys are, are uh, doing a good job with that. Uh, the analytics is tremendous because I know not even two years ago we were asking, well, how do you know how many people? And, and it wasn't even you, but before we took it in, but you guys grabbed it by the horns. I really appreciate that. Women make the, the social decisions, so I'm not discouraged <laughs> that 60% of, of, of the people are, are women. Um, with regard to Slide the City, I think that was a huge success. What were our minimums or what were they hoping? Because I know we blew that out of the water, no pun intended, but <laughs> could there, could there, you allu go ahead? There was a minimum uh, attendance maximum. or no, a maximum. No. I apologize. You were trying to hope for <laughs> X, and we got X plus. And if I recall, and this is off the top of my head, um, they had a maximum of four thousand tickets yes. that they were felt comfortable with. Mm -hmm. um, their goal was probably somewhere around twenty-five to three in a particularly in a first-year event um, in an unproven area. Um, we met 4,000, no problem. Right. Mm -hmm. So we are a proven area, and we were the first in Arizona. Yeah. Yeah. This was huge. Real, I want to share with um, with everything I do. I'm in, I'm in real estate, and everybody was coming up to me saying, what's going on in Fountain Hills? Because you guys did a, a great job of getting the word out on, on that particular event. It was neat. So thank you, Mayor. Okay. Anyone else? Anyone else? Councilman Leger. Thank you, Mayor. The two of you are just an awesome team. <laughs> I mean, you really are. I mean, what you have done with the tourism program in a relatively short time period is very, very impressive. And I just really enjoy the way you interact with, with the community and outside the community, the professionalism that you demonstrate. So you're fantastic. Keep up the good work. And we, we, we love those smiles. It's just awesome. Thank you. Not everyone that comes up here smiles at us. So thank you very much. Appreciate that. <laughs> You guys are always nice to me, so there's <laughs> never a reason not to smile. And we're glad you're young enough to understand Twitter. <laughs> we still haven't gotten that yet. He's still working on the app, I think. <laughs> <laughs> All right, if there's nothing else, okay. Thank you very much, and yep. congratulations. Great job. Okay. Next, we have a presentation of the quarterly budget report by our finance director, Craig Rodolfi. That for the quarter ending June 30th, 2015. Grady? Mayor and Council, before you tonight is our finance director, Craig Rudolphy, and he's going to be giving a report to you on our finances 
as it relates to the end of the last fiscal year. With that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to, to Mr. Rodolfi. I'll start shortly. <laughs> Mayor and Council Members, thank you. Um, unfortunately, I don't have nearly as interesting a presentation, and I don't have any pictures to show. So, and my statistics aren't going to be nearly as exciting. So, please bear with but me. But you're smiling, so as yeah, required. I, you scared me, saying, "Well, we lost twenty-five thousand. So, it's not that bad, is it?" No. <laughs> so, I'm going to be talking about uh, our. Funding, and we're going to be using the term operating fund, which is a just slightly broader interpretation than what most people use and call the general fund. So I just want to make sure everybody knows that our general fund includes a couple other pieces that aren't typically um, included in the uh, general fund. So these are our revenues for the entire year. As you can see, our operating fund makes up about 39% of our total revenues. And the operating fund is the one that covers all of our uh, general government operations, police, fire, parks, community center. And then our other funds are all restricted for other purposes. Moving on to just the operating fund. These are where our revenues that we use for operations come from. Local sales tax, as you all know, is by far the largest contributor, accounting for 52%. And between that and our state shared revenues of income tax and sales tax, they account for 86% of our operating revenues. Fortunately for this year, our revenues came in at 103% of our budget in total. Once again, this is a breakdown of our operating fund, showing you for what they've done for the last three years. Um, sales tax is, is slightly higher and so is shared, state shared revenues. And here's a farther breakdown of state shared revenues. They represent 33% of our operating money. So collectively, once again, we're up to 89% of all our revenues are coming from either shared revenues or local sales tax. Very little other revenue for the town to operate under. So here we go with the local sales tax for all of our funds. They're 52% of the grand total. You can see the trend for the last five years, um, what our budget is and what our five-year um, average is. It was at 103.8% of our budget. For the retail component, it was up 6.5% over the prior year, and so it's trending nicely. Restaurant and bars are continuing to increase a little bit less than um, what our budget was expected to be. Telecom and communications, um, once again, a little bit of an increase, uh, but just slightly six, per, six tenths of 1% higher. Here's our biggest jump in construction sales tax, 13% um, over. Um, just a refresher, 50% of that construction sales tax goes to our capital improvement fund. Um, as you all know, effective January 1st of this calendar year, the rules for um, construction sales tax changed. We still do not have a good handle on what our income is going to be, whether it's going to remain the same or go down based on the new calculations of how construction sales tax is to be paid. Expenditures, here are our fund expenditures by the, uh, by the fund, and then a little recap by our departments. Um, expenditures were over almost 2% from last year, but fortunately still under budget. For our other funds, here is our main fund for highway user resident fund that we use for pavement maintenance and repairs. It consists of uh, the HERF revenues as well as our vehicle license tax revenues. And they're up 26% from the prior year. Expenditures, as you all know, the majority of the expenditures are going to pavement management. Um, we spent 1.3 million. Um, we have deferred the revenue that we received this year, accumulating it throughout the year, so that in this upcoming year, in fact, later on the agenda tonight, you have a, 
contract to consider that we'll be spending the money that we collected from last year for pavement, man man pavement management. Here's revenues and expenses for all of our other funds. Um, nothing really exciting to, to see. Uh, I know council is always concerned with our fund balances, what our quote reserves are. Um, the general fund has approximately $9 million and the other big fund is capital projects, but it is down dramatically from previously and we only have $10 million in the capital projects fund and we're still having to pay for Saguaro construction out of that as well as Ashbrook Wash when we start that. Mm -hmm. um, so in summary, Revenues expenditures are both favorably trending. Um, our reserve balances are all acceptable, meeting our policy. Operating fund revenues were 3% over budget and 6.6% higher than last year. Expenditures are almost 2% under budget, but also 2% higher than last year. Pavement management continues to be a priority and I feel somewhat comfortable that our economic indicators are remaining stable. That's it. Questions? Okay. All right. Thank you for the presentation. Questions? Councilman Yates. Yes. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Craig, excellent job. I know that was a very exciting uh, presentation. Anytime you show above income and good job. 2% um, increase in expenditures. Could you elaborate? Was it one line item that we had a spike? I realized that the uh, additional construction revenue kind of pulled us out of that, but it's, we talk about trending. Is there any trending of additional expenditures? I, I realize our um, safety, yeah, uh, safety fee was a big uh, um, contributor it, to that. But Administration went down by roughly $300,000, $253,000 due to some retirement of our bonds and not having to make up the contribution from our general fund. And that's probably the only significant change. Um, the rest is we had a 10% increase in law enforcement okay. and um, fire and emergency also went up by about 3%. Okay. Thank and you. those two collectively account for over 50% of our operating expenditures. Good. Okay. Thanks, Craig. Questions? Councilman yes. Leger. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Craig, nice job. And. Um, Expenditures under budget and revenues uh, higher than we anticipated. So kudos to you and the entire staff for, for managing our budget and our expenses and coming in, frankly, um, under budget. So expenses under budget, revenue um, above budget. So is it fair to say that we had a surplus? Um, and if so, what was that surplus? We did have a surplus, and the surplus was about $650,000. Okay, very good, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Councilman Magazine? Uh, thanks, Craig. Interesting to look in the rearview mirror, but I'm gonna ask you to look forward for a minute. Uh, Accountants don't like to do that. <laughs> <laughs> He's not gonna smile. Um, yeah, you stopped smiling. <laughs> um, we all know what the budget is. We know what we are anticipating in terms of revenue and so on. As you look ahead, what are the unknowns? What are the things that concern you? Um, public safety costs. We're faced with uh, some increases from the um, MCSO contract that we're not able to quantify at the current time. Um, we have aging infrastructure that we really need to address, not just out in the public, but our buildings need or have, are having deferred maintenance that needs to be addressed and we really don't have a ready funding source for major maintenance and repairs. Um, are, are some of the communities in the valley still pursuing um, uh, surveys as related to um, state shared revenues, population surveys? Uh, yes, there are some that are definitely uh, moving forward with a new uh, mid-census decade, which will uh, decrease in all probability will decrease our uh, portion of state shared revenues. And um, we clearly have a roads problem. Um, we're delaying uh, the first zone by a full year. It's gonna cost, what, half a million dollars more than 
what we anticipate. Is that correct? Uh, I'd probably defer that <laughs> to our development services director. Okay, I, I mean, that's my understanding. At the last meeting or the meeting before, they identified over 50 uh, parts of Zone 1 that need to be completely replaced. They may be small, but, and that would drain, as I understand it, that would drain the HERF funds down to zero. Does that sound correct? Uh, we plan on spending the majority of her funds this year, yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Craig? Not? Thank you very much. All right, uh, call to the public. Do we have any speaker cards? No, Mayor. Okay, then we'll go on to our consent agenda. We have 12 items. Can I get a motion to accept them as written? So moved. Mayor, second. All right, um, and I'll need a roll call vote for that, please. Mayor Kavanaugh? Uh, yes. Councilmember Council member DePorter? Aye. Vice Mayor Brown? I will recuse myself from item number nine, and I will vote aye on one through 11. <laughs> one through 12. Councilmember Yates? Aye. And Councilmember Magazine? Aye. Councilmember Leger? Aye. Mayor 6 0. All right, thank you. Now we go on to our regular agenda items. Um, and if there's no objection from the council, we are going to move item number 18 uh, up to number to our first item on the agenda items. Any objection to that? If not, uh, consideration of a contract for legal services between the Town of Fountain Hills and the Law Office of Mark Iacovino <coughs> for fiscal year 2015-16 and fiscal year 2016-17. Grady, let's start. Yes, uh, Mayor and Council, you'll recall that this particular agenda item was before the Council on June 18th. And at the time, the Council agreed to table this uh, until September 3rd. There were some questions regarding uh, workload and some other questions that have since been answered. And uh, this item was also discussed um, in the executive session. With that, I'll go ahead and turn it back over to the, the Council. Thank you. Are there any speaker cards on this item? No, Mayor. Okay. And I'll just inform the council that Mr. Iacovino is here if you have any questions. Any discussion on the item? Make Councilman motion. Brown. Please. I move to approve a contract with Mark Iacovino to provide prosecution services for the town of Fountain Hills for the period of July 1st, 2015 through June 30th, 2017 in the amount of $100,000 per year. Mayor, second. All right, any discussion on the motion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Mayor, 6-0. All right, thank you very much. Now we'll go back to item number 13. Consideration of a liquor license application submitted by Penny Zimmerman, owner agent of Norma Jeans LLC, doing business as Monroe's Bar and Grill, located at 13014 North Suara Boulevard, number 101, Fountain Hills. This is for a Series 12 license restaurant. Grady? Yes, Mayor and Council, before you, as you stated, Mayor, there is a request for a liquor license um, application before it is submitted to the State Liquor License Board. And the name of the restaurant is Monroe's Bar and Grill. And as part of every liquor license application, we go through a, a process of reviewing um, an extensive list of criteria to ensure that it's meeting the community standards and state law as it uh, applies to, to liquor licenses. With that, we have um, Commander David Letourneau here tonight, who's going to go over um, you know, his recommendations from the Sheriff's Department as it relates to this particular application. Good evening, Mayor and members of the Council. Um, Captain. As the Town Manager explained, uh, it's our role to go over the t issues with the liquor licenses as, as they are put in for the town. Um, and after extensive, I'll use the word investigations, because that's basically what it is with, with the, the process and the application that they fill out, the applicant fills out. Uh, it is our recommendation as with the Sheriff's Office to not recommend uh, 
issuing the license in this case. There are too many circumstances that we've discovered and looked into that it's a recommendation from the sheriff's office to the town to not, not approve the license. Okay. If there's any direct questions, I can answer those at this time. Council, questions for the captain? Mm, no questions, okay. Um, any speaker Mayor. cards? No, Mayor. I'm sorry, Councilman Max. Well, I just want to state that um, uh, for the public, um, that we do, we do get reports, uh, as we do on all items that come before us, and so we are uh, privy to a lot of information uh, about these kinds, some of these applications. I just want to make that clear. All right. Do we have any speaker cards on this item? No, Mayor. No? Okay. Uh, with no council discussion, then I am entertaining a motion. Mayor, if I may, please. Thank you. Motion Vice to Mayor. deny the liquor license application submitted by Penny G. Zimmerman, owner agent of Norma Jeans LLC, doing business as Monroe's Bar and Grill, located at 13014 North Saguaro Boulevard, number 101, Fountain Hills, Arizona. All right. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Do I have a second on that motion? Second. A second from Councilman Magazine. Um, any further discussion on the motion? If not, all in favor of the motion? Aye. Is there anyone opposed? Mayor, 6 0. Thank you, Captain. Thank you. Number 14, consideration of a special event application for the Fountain Bike Fest event pre presented by the Fountain Hills Chamber of Commerce to be held in <coughs> Fountain Hills from Friday, April 8th through Sunday, April 10th, 2016. The event will run from 12 noon to 9 p.m. on Friday, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Saturday, and 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Sunday. Grady? Yes. Um, well, we're, we're very pleased to present this new special event application for your consideration. This went through our special events uh, committee, and they have formulated a positive recommendation to the council. With us tonight, um, our recreation supervisor, Rachel Goodwin, would be happy to, to give a little bit of an overview of this. And also, the applicants are here tonight. Uh, the chamber director and staff would be happy to answer any questions that perhaps our staff are unable to. So with that, I'll go ahead and have uh, Rachel come up to the podium. I'm back again. Now you see why I had Grace present earlier, so you didn't have to listen to me all night. Um, tonight I'm here to introduce a new special event, just like you heard, um, to take place here in Fountain Hills. Uh, the event is an endeavor spearheaded by the Fountain Hills Chamber of Commerce, um, but it does have a steering committee comprised of local businesses and organizations, um, specifically um, McDowell, Mountain, uh, McDowell Mountain Regional Park is a part of it, as well as McDowell Mountain Cycles and others in our community. The event, titled... The Fountain Bike Fest uh, is proposed for April 8th through 10th. Um, that was a specific date chosen um, based on other events in the area uh, specific to the cycling community. And it would be held principally at Fountain, uh, Fountain Park. Uh, obviously, with a bike event, there are other impacts on our roadways. Um, but the bulk of the event would be at the park. Um, it consists of multiple rides with varying degrees of difficulty, as well as um, variable course routes and distances. Um, it would also feature vendors, entertainment, food, beer garden, and other festival-like amenities down at the park. The event application was reviewed by the Special Events Committee and was given a unanimous approval. Tonight, the event is seeking council support as well as co-sponsorship with the town in which they've requested a waiver of park fees and permit fees as well as staff and volunteer support. So that should give you a little overview. Um, at this point, I'd like to ask um, the chair of the committee, Sharon Morgan, to come up and she can probably explain some of the finer points and give you more details. All right, thanks Rachel. Thank you, Mayor Morgan for joining Hello, us. Hello, Mayor <laughs> and Council. Um, it is our goal with this new event to present our beautiful town of Fountain Hills to another venue, i.e. the cycling venue which if any of you watch any of the Tour de France and all, all the different tours all over the United States, is becoming a very, very popular event. And a whole new element of people to come see our town. And so we are part of other towns' races. Scottsdale comes through Fountain Hills. 
Mount Mesa comes through Fountain Hills. So now Fountain Hills, we want to have our own. So with, we started this idea, and we've come to you to get your blessings, your permission to proceed with this Fountain Bike Fest, more commonly known now as FBF. Um, it has something for everybody. Uh, it is my understanding and my knowledge that we are trying to promote Fountain Hills as a family-friendly community. Come on, we're going to have every, something for everybody. Every age group, the kids, everybody. So first I'm going to issue a challenge to all of you. You have eight months to prepare, and there will be events that each and every one of you can participate in, and I look forward to seeing it. Um, we do have a presentation, and I have with me Brent from McDowell Mountain Cycles, which for lack of a more original term, I call my guru in getting this off the ground, because what I know about cycling is what I fell off my bicycle about 50 or 60 years ago. He knows a lot more about the professionalism and everything. So I'm going to call Brent up here to give you a little bit of a presentation of the different routes and things that we want to do. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Brent Graham. I'm one of the owners of McDowell Mountain Cycles here in town. And uh, as Sharon said, I'm helping them get this off the ground. And what I'm going to show you for starters are some of the routes that I came up with. You'll note that I ride my bike in a lot of interesting places. Please disregard most of these. Uh, let's see. The first one would be Friday night's Criterium. If you're not familiar with what a Criterium is, it's about a one-mile circuit race. It's a very American form of racing, uh, kind of like NASCAR. So really entertaining and a lot of fun as a spectator event, not just a participation event. Let's see. This one, we plan to go around the fountain since we'll have all the festivities at the park, so just before sunset. And that's it, right there. Can you see that? Yeah. So start finish is right there at Avenue of the Fountains. Uh, we'll have a men's and a women's race. Um, that's really about it for that one. Um, the Saturday morning, Saturday is mountain bike day. And we will have two distances. The long one is about 50 miles. Wow. It's a tough race. Are you, are you up for that? <coughs> who who wants in on that one? I, I, I missed my New Year's resolution this year. So <laughs> I may do the around the fountain or if there's a smaller one around the block. You need a bike Fair enough. Mine. <laughs> I can drive. You can be in the bike parade. Yeah. Uh, so this is, uh, this is the 50 mile route right here and there it is. So I tried to design the route to get out of town. We, you know, we, we have a lot of mountain bike races out at the park, but people, we all go to the park, we race, we leave. Whether you live here or not, we wanted to capture and have that, that festival feeling right in the city center. And a lot of towns do this and it's a, it's a huge boon for towns that do do this. Um, but that means if you're gonna do a mountain bike race, you've gotta get the racers out to the trail, back from the trail um, with the least amount of impact. So that's what I tried to do here. And I'll zoom in so you can see where I have people going. We can do it any number of ways. I had them just, just going up to uh, Palisades from, uh, from Avenue of the Fountains, and then Golden Eagle, and then going up to the Thompson Peak uh, service road, 
and then into the park the back way there. And then we can talk about all the trails, but um, that's mainly the, as, as far as that I mean, we're going to hit all kinds of trails that even some trails that are not normally raced on, which is kind of cool because I, I've raced out at McDowell a zillion times and it'll be nice for competitors to be able to come and do something that, that they don't always do and, and race on trails that they're not used to racing on. Um, now I'll show you the, the, then the 35 mile race uses the, the same streets to get out and back rather than having two routes. And then on Sunday, we wanted the road cyclists to have their, their event. And it's a great way to send people all around our town and showcase our town on the roads. I wanted to send everybody up and down the neighborhood roads that I train on all the time because they're so cool. But it's probably not going to work. So uh, I just have us starting right at, they all start right at the fountain and working their way on the newly repaved Saguaro, which should be a joy to ride on, uh, south to Shea, and then a ride on Shea, climb, 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 and then up the Three Sisters on Palisades. We all have more colorful names for those hills that I won't mention. And then we'll enjoy the descent down Palisades and back into town. And that is, the idea behind this is that it's a circuit race and you can, in the allotted time, you can do as many circuits as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of nice because a lot of these events, it's not necessarily a race, although you can go for a personal record or whatever. Um, but if mom wants to go do this and dad wants to hang with the kids, mom comes by every hour instead of going out for four hours on a big long course she comes by they can high five her you know she can get uh get a banana and some <laughs> electrolyte drink or whatever and, and keep going mm -hmm. what's that yeah. 10 miles in an hour <laughs> yeah that's got me at 40 minutes i don't think that's accurate Anyhow, that's it for the, uh, the proposed routes. Along with that, we want to have, down in the park, we want to have bands. We want to have children's activities. We want to have family activities, um, concessions, sponsors booth, all kinds of things going on down there in the park. So with that, I would ask for your approval, hopefully, that we can proceed and begin to get into the meat of this event in earnest. Thank you for your time. All right, any questions for um, Vice Mayor Brown? Thank you, Mayor. I was uh, privileged to live in the People's Republic of Boulder, Colorado when the Tourist <laughs> Classic started. And I have to admit that it brought, the very first year it was, it was highly publicized and it was and, and you heard all the bicyclists talking about it and enjoying it. But every year thereafter, the, the streets on the Criterium was completely packed, four and five people deep. And then on the circuit races, I mean, all the way around the, the 10, 12-mile track, 70-mile tracks, people lined up on the road just elbow to elbow to see it. I mean, it's a big deal. So I have to say, who have we contacted? Have we talked, contacted any of the cycling magazines to tell them about our race and have we started contacting NBC because they're a huge supporter of the bicycle races. Have we started really getting out on the streets? With your approval tonight, we will be starting all of that. We did not want to get too far into it <laughs> because we never know what's going to happen when you come up here in front of everybody. But we will begin probably tomorrow we already have some ideas along those lines. We know we have to get a website. We know we have to do a lot of, a lot of work, a lot of sponsors. We have 
amateur riders here. We have some who are riders from Fountain Hills on this teams that are professionals. I've been told that I, we should expect a minimum of about 200 to 250 riders, probably closer to five or 600 riders. That's the first year. We want this to be an annual event. And I'm going to throw in one other thing that I would like to work on. Two of our sister cities are big riders in the world, and that's in Belgium and Germany. If we get this off the ground this year, we will throw out the challenge to our sister cities to get us some international riders. And that would put us on bigger maps than the Arizona Republic. <laughs> so again, we will start with, with your approval and blessings. We will start on this tomorrow. I just want to say this is fantastic. It, for me, it hits on every box of what I think makes an awesome event for the town with um, how you've thought about um, all age ranges, um, of skill levels, um, food vendors. You had me at beer garden. I mean, music and bands, children activities. I mean, it's really all-encompassing and exactly the type of event that we all talk about wanting to see more and more of. So thank you so much for... Whoever came up with the idea, and I, I, I'm really excited to see this here in our town. Be a good deal for the town. Councilman Magazine. There's a fellow sitting at a table in the back of the room who wrote, he's looking behind him, <laughs> who wrote an outstanding editorial this week about Mayor Morgan. And I just want to, you haven't seen it? You look surprised. I have. You're oh, kidding. Oh, with the sister cities? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I do. Yeah. And I just want to say the accolades are well deserved. Uh, both for sister cities, for the work you've done at the chamber over all these years. Um, and I would just echo what uh, Councilman DePorter said. These kinds of events are just invaluable for our town. Things like this, like the city and other things. And so I just want to congratulate you and, and Scott, new head of the chamber, and all of you for uh, putting this together. I think it's wonderful. Thank you. Well, I'm excited about that. Brent knows. We talked about this a long time ago. And I won't be racing, but I'll be hanging out on my townie. Uh -huh. <laughs> and um, at the, I think you were here, you saw the league presentation when the kids brought down the flag. And we had the opportunity to have two sentences. They give you a short little something that you can say that's announced while they're bringing the flag down. And I want to read to you what we, what we read at the, con what, at the conference. Set your cycling goals high and don't stop till you get there. The best bike routes are the ones you haven't ridden. Discover biking in Fountain Hills. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and of course you see our lovely picture there with the bike and that won an award. And so, yeah, we wanna, we wanna put ourselves on the map for biking here in Fountain Hills. So we thank you for your support and Mayor Morgan and Scott from the Chamber. All right. Any Further, Councilman Yates. If I may. Thank you, Mayor. I move to approve the event and co-sponsorship as presented. Second. All right. Uh, any speaker cards on this item? No, Mayor. All right. Any further council discussion? If not, all in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Mayor 6-0. Thank, Thank you. Thank you both for coming. And Thanks remember that eight-month challenge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> see we'll have something for all of you. <laughs> uh -huh. well, I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the next item is for discussion only. We have an update regarding the Technology Learning Center's future use of the space in the community center. Grady? Yes, uh, Mayor and Council, uh, you'll recall that back in May, Mark uh, gave a report to the Council regarding the, the Technology Learning Center. Uh, Technology Learning Center has been a community partner of the towns for many years and uh, utilize space on a long-term basis over at the community center. Uh, there were some issues over time because uh, the space, uh, you know, we have a finite amount of space at the community center, and so there were other needs as well. And so basically, uh, Mark and the Community Service Advisory Board, there was a working group between uh, us and also the 
Technology Learning Center. And so you recall back in May, the council went ahead and extended the lease through the end of September. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mark, who has an update as to where we stand right now with this, um, this arrangement. Mayor Cavanaugh, members of the council. Um, as Mr. Grady indicated uh, before you a number of months ago, uh, sought the approval for an extension of the lease which you granted. Uh, we felt like we were uh, close to making a, uh, an agreement that was both in the best interest of the town and the TLC. It's my pleasure to tell you this evening that we have reached that goal. Uh, so it has proven successful. Um, the main uh, idea that we were looking for, what we were trying to accomplish, is trying to greater utilize that space over at the community center. And I think we've been able to do that. Uh, I will be able to demonstrate to you tonight that uh, the uh, Technology Learning Center uh, is pleased with the arrangement. We've actually also done a partnership where they used to offer uh, Time for Us, which was a workshop uh, that will now be run through the Activity Center with uh, the volunteers from the TLC providing the staffing. So they will not pay for that time because we're going to offer it as a community service. So uh, we've been able to make some arrangements that not only take care of the, the space issue, but also, I think, ultimately uh, make it a better situation for not only town, TLC, but also the, the uh, citizens. Um, in the report that I sent to you, uh, I want to emphasize just a couple of things. Um, as I said, we did reach an agreement. There's a copy of that in there uh, that we are uh, sharing with you this evening. I wanted to emphasize three what I thought were very important points. These are that the TLC would enter a contract for space at the prevailing not-for-profit rate and would pay for the time only that they use the room. The rest of the time would be available for the either activity center, recreation programs, or the general public utilize that space. So in that sense, we accomplished the goal that we were looking for. The second item that I wanted to note is TLC would have up to seven days uh, before the start of a class to cancel with no costs associated with that cancellation, which is exactly what we do with the recreation programs. So it would allow them uh, the maximum time they would need to see if they could make that particular class go, but still allow us an opportunity if the class was canceled to be able to potentially utilize it for another space, for another need. And then the final one that I thought was particularly important, uh, they would be billed at a monthly rate but on a uh, quarterly basis. Uh, for any long-term use, which is identical to what we do with uh, the Nutrisystem program that meets on a weekly basis. Obviously, the uh, TLC would be m meeting several times on a week, but it was a, it's a very similar kind of arrangement. Though I, those items that I mentioned would be incorporated into the existing document that we use for uh, every single rental of the community center. So in, in that sense, I think it closely follows what we've done with other groups. So joining me this evening is... Uh, Mr. Sherman Abramson, who uh, kind of chaired the Community Service Advisory Commission work group, so he has a few comments, and then uh, I've also asked if Mr. Craner uh, would like to come up and speak, who represents the TLC. All right. Good evening, everyone. You know I'm Sherman Abrahamson, and I had the distinction, I guess, of running this work study group as vice chair of the commission. Um, Mark has laid out the details for you pretty well, and I don't see any need for me to reiterate that other than just be verbose, and that's not necessary. When we started out with this program many months ago, we weren't sure where we were, where we were heading, and we were hoping to accomplish the goal that we have now reached, and I'm happy that we have done that, and um, there hasn't been too much angst about all of it, and it's working out. So I'm pleased, and we're asking you to approve that. Thank you. Sherman, I want to thank you for all the work that I know you've done on this to bring all the parties together. And it's just wonderful when you can come here and say, we have an agreement. And that's just perfect. That's great. Yes, thank we you. do. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Good evening. and Council. Mm -hmm. My name is Ralph Craner, and I'm uh, a resident of Fountain Hills. Been here since 85, so I've seen the town grow. TLC uh, is very happy that we finally came to agreement. We, uh, we actually found three people who knew what the town needed, who knew what the activity center needed, and then I had a volunteer who needed 
who knew what we needed. So between the three of them, they hammered out a, a real agreement that we're happy with. I think it'll grow, and we're very happy that Kelly volunteered, or I don't know how Kathy and Kelly came to an agreement, but uh, I teased uh, Kelly saying that if there are any more problems with telephones to talk to Kelly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she uh, was not happy when she talked to me on Tuesday. But <laughs> We'll, we'll staff time for you, and uh, she's going to make sure she advertises. I think it'll benefit us both. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you also for all the work that you did on this. Just to wrap things up, um, so the existing lease that we have with uh, TLC would expire on September 28th, or at the time that they exit the, the space. Um, and would be prorated if it was before that particular date. And the latest information I have from Ralph, it will be before that particular date. That will allow us to go in and do some cleaning, the carpeting, painting, whatever else needs to be done in the room to be able to utilize it more fully. And then at this point, it requires no further action from the council. I just wanted to update you on the status because we will enter into an agreement with the TLC for space in the building. Okay. So with that, I would questions? answer any questions you might have. Councilman Yates. Thank you, Mayor. Mark, great job. I appreciate the fact that uh, when good people get in the same room, they figure some things out. That's tremendous. Um, but just for the record, um, I don't know, Grady or Andrew, if, if you all could elaborate on why we don't need to sign off on this, why it's an administrative uh, uh, contract, so to speak. Well, essentially, we have booking agreements that we do that are administrative at the community center. This is what's a little bit more unique about this is that it's a long-term, long-range type of agreement. So with that, um, the key was that we needed to have an, an agreement um, in concept to what we were proposing on both sides for this long-term lease. And so um, to the best of my knowledge, we really do not need one. I think it could be done administratively, administratively with a booking agreement. Um, and. We can also do a memo or an, a, an addendum that identifies their unique aspects of this versus typical booking agreements that we do. Thank you, Mayor. Any other questions, Mark? Okay. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Okay. All right, we're up to item 16, consideration of authorizing the purchase of new playground equipment from Exerplay in the amount of $46,883.87. Grady? Yes, I'm going to turn it over to Mark in a moment, but I just wanted to just make an a introductory remark, and that is this is a, a, a feel-good moment here. Um, you know, when you can have a community partner or civic organization that's very active in the community, such as the Kiwanis, and actually help replace a tot lot at a park, and come in at 50% at of the cost, it's amazing. And um, I'm very proud that this organization is, is in our community and is very active. And this isn't the only good work that they've done. And there's a lot of other good organizations in town that do these kinds of projects and partner up with the town. But I just wanted to just highlight that before I turn it over to our community services director. Great. Thanks, Grady. Thank you. Uh, I am pleased again to stand before you this evening with what I uh, can tell you is a culmination of a many years of effort. Um, given the town's financial situation, this particular piece of playground equipment, as you can see the cost, they have become very, very expensive. This particular piece that's there, as time has gone on, it has fallen into service, and it's old enough now that we cannot buy replacement parts. So really the integrity of the piece that exists out there now is a fraction of what it used to be. And the problem was always the, the financial situation that the town found itself in. Um, I want to recognize uh, Mike Charno, who um, came to me, as you saw in that cover letter, um, back in 2014 and said, can we work out some kind of a partnership? And uh, ultimately, we uh, were able to put those funds in the budget. The council was supportive of that. And so it's uh, pretty close to a 50-50 match between the town and ourselves on that cost. Uh, they are here this evening to present a ceremonial check as well as the real check that I will give to the town finance person uh, right after this meeting. But it appears that with your approval, we will have the culmination of what has been, like I said, a, a uh, an effort for the, at least the last year, but going back really many, many years before that. 
Right. So uh, I have the particulars in there about the, uh, the dollar amounts back and forth. This is a picture of the particular piece. The only difference is the, there's a little bit of difference in the color. But essentially what you see there, including the uh, surface that's underneath it, will be very, very similar. And the cover over it? The cover actually is existing. Uh -huh. um, so that will remain, and it's, and it's in good shape. Still in good so, shape. Yes. Okay. It's amazing what these things cost. Yes, it is, it is very expensive. Some of what uh, the cost is is below grade. They have to do a lot of excavation. There's a lot of footings. Every one of those pipes that penetrates in the ground requires a footing. In addition, you have to put a playground-approved rubber surface down. It's either got to be rubber or uh, sand or some other kind of surface. Um, it can't be sand. I should qualify that. It has to be a tr so you can transition from a wheelchair to the device and be able to go throughout the device. So it's gotten a lot more complicated and got a lot more expensive. And not surprisingly, there have been a number of lawsuits associated with playgrounds. So uh, there's a big liability component associated with playgrounds now. And they insure the peace. Mm -hmm. So it's not the okay. town in that sense. Wow, great. Yeah. Uh, questions for Mark? Any questions? Just a comment. <coughs> comment. Just a sure. comment. This is fantastic, and thank you to Mike and uh, Kiwanis for, for, for thinking about this and partnering with the town on it. As a frequent shopper and user of that park, um, my, my one-year-old thinks she, my four-year-old thinks she, we're there all the time, and there's a lot of people over there. Nick, you use that slide. And I yeah. do. I exceed the weight limit of the slide. That's probably what happened to the last equipment, exceeding weight limit problems. But it's fantastic that... I see that, I look at Splash Pad, I see a lot of children and families around there, especially this park because of the basketball courts for the older kids and the younger kids. So I just want to thank, thank Mark for working with, with Mike and Mike and your Kiwanis team for, for putting it out there. Thank you. I also want to recognize, joining us this evening is the current president, Al Rosenlieb, uh, with the new Kiwanis. And, um, he wants to come up after hopefully a decision is made to move ahead and present a ceremonial check to the mayor. Okay. Okay. Great. I think Councilman Magazine would like to say yeah, something. Yeah, um, thank God I don't have a one-year-old or a four-year-old. <laughs> um, but I have been over there and I've seen it. And there are other pieces of equipment. I'm just curious as to what kind of condition they are in. Um, for the most part, I would say overall the, the playgrounds in town are in pretty good shape. Uh, the one, for instance, at uh, Four Peaks Park is relatively new. We put in two new pieces of playground equipment with the last upgrade at Fountain Park. Um, the, uh, we have age-specific playground equipment. This is for younger kids. Right on the other side is playground equipment for older kids. That is relatively new as well. So, uh, and the Desert Vista piece is brand new. So I would say the town of Fountain Hills is in very good position on their playground equipment. Yeah, I, I this will I, be the last uh, grape on the string, so to speak. I, I guess I wasn't clear. I was talking specifically about Golden Eagle. Um, okay. The, the condition of the other pieces are pretty good? Yes. Uh, we, we only have one other piece. We have this, this piece would be for the younger kids. And then just to the south of that is a piece that is designed for older kids. Right. And that's in very, very good shape. Good shape. Yep. Okay. Any other comments? Any speaker cards? No, Mayor. Okay. Then with that, I will entertain a motion. So moved. Second. All right. All in favor of the motion? Aye. Any opposed? Mayor, 6-0. All right. Now, the check. I found it interesting that uh -huh. um, although the amount is more than twice what the uh, Republic Services was, the check is half the physical uh -huh. size. So <laughs> I'm not sure what happened there. All right, Mike, who's going to take the picture? Are you? Okay. Thank you, Mark, and it's our pleasure to be in front of the council and to Mayor Cavanaugh. A project of this significance uh, would not have been possible without the enthusiastic support and encouragement of the following groups and persons. First of all, to the town council and to Mayor Cavanaugh for your approval of the funds and the budget. Secondly, of course, to Mark Mayer, uh, Director of Community Services and his park staff, who worked very closely with Mike and other Aquanians to see this to a fruition. Uh, of course, to Newman's Own and USA Today for their wonderful $10,000 grant. Heather Ware, uh, who is an angel in our community, and her Make a Difference Day committee for selecting our Noon Kiwanis Club uh, to receive this grant. Uh, we had several gifts, uh, major gifts to the project. Vern C. Johnson Family Foundation donated $5,000. Uh, the Qantas International Foundation gave us $5,000. And we had uh, other private contributors that 
uh, gave money toward this project. So the, we also want to, are very grateful to the personnel of the Exeter Play and the landscape uh, structures for working uh, with both us in the design and the signage and the Kiwanis branding and so on. Uh, this project is in honor and dedicated to Kiwanis International 100th anniversary and to our noon club in Fountain Hills 40th anniversary. I'd like to personally thank Mike Sharno, our past president, uh, who has seen this project from its beginning and working with Mark all the way to its full fruition and to its full realization. We're very happy this evening to present the check for $23,000 to Mayor Cavanaugh and the Town Council. It perfectly exemplifies our Kiwanis International motto of serving the children of the world. Can we write the story? <laughs> it's alleged. <laughs> We're not sure where he got the money. All right, item 17, presentation of proposed contract with American Metering Services Incorporated, doing business as AMS Billing Services to implement the environmental fee adopted by the council on November 20th, 2014. Brady? Just a question. Um, was there a motion to approve and second? Uh, council Member yes. Leger was asking. I, I yes. didn't catch it either. Okay, thank yes. you. We got everything. Beth, did we go? Did we? Yeah. Thank you. Um, before us tonight is a request um, that came up at the last council meeting regarding the environmental fee. You recall approximately November last year, the council approved a $3 a month environmental fee. And the purpose of that environmental fee is to help us recover the costs of a number of mandated environmental activities the town has to provide. With us tonight is our finance director, Craig Rudolphy, who has a presentation. At the last meeting, it was requested that we come back and, and give a formal presentation, primarily for the purpose of the general public. And Mr. Rudolphy is going to do that and also go through um, a lot of the ideas that we have for public outreach and trying to get the word out of, and uh, education about this particular um, new initiative. With that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Rudolphy. Mayor and Council, I'm back again. Don't know that I'd like to be here twice, but we'll see. So we're going to talk about the stormwater environmental fee. Just some background. Some of you, I'm sure, are aware of it. There's been 18 prior Council discussions about such a fee. And then, as Mr. Miller indicated, the November meeting, Council voted 4 to 3 to approve a $3 per month fee per parcel to offset the cost of uh, the environmental program. To talk about the program, there's been five different articles in the Fountain Hills Times since September of 2014 when the topic first came up. As you know, the town is 20.32 square miles. We've got a lot of storm drains, more feet of curb and gutter, and lots of miles of streets. All of these should be familiar numbers to you from previous discussions. Um, street sweeping for residential streets are done once every eight weeks and arterial streets are once every three weeks. 
There's 407 catch basins, 700 acres of town-owned washes, which we try to maintain on a regular basis of attacking 40 acres a year. And there are six town-owned dams. What we tried to do after the council vote to implement the fee is we talked to some entities to ascertain their ability and interest to assist us in billing for this fee. We talked to the Fountain Hill Sanitary District, talked to Chaparral City Water Company, and also talked to Republic Services. Unfortunately, because of our decision to bill per parcel, none of these entities are able to provide us with that ability to bill per parcel. So we then considered an in-house alternative of creating some software to do the billing in-house. Uh, my issue is staffing manpower. We do not have the staff to handle preparation, sending, and receiving payment for in excess of 15,000 individual bills. So what we did is we did a request for proposal. We sent it out, released it on May 27th, advertised it in both the Times and the Arizona Business Gazette. The final date for inquiries was on June 15th. We held a pre-proposal conference on June 15th, same day, and there was one attendee at the pre-proposal conference, and the proposals were due on June 30th. Unfortunately, we only received one response to our RFP and that was submitted by the company American Metering Services out of Florida, and they were also the only people that attended the pre-proposal conference. After the RFP was issued, we posted it on the website so it was available for everyone to see. We also did independent searches on the internet looking for utility building companies that could help us. We sent individual emails to those companies identified from our internet searches trying to obtain contact information. We also called some software companies to ask for their recommendations on who could help us implement such a fee. Here are some of the costs that are trying to be covered by our stormwater environmental fee. Once again, you've seen um, our environmental manager present this to you in the past. Um, individually, they don't seem to be a lot of money. Collectively, they do add up to a lot. That's the first batch. Here's another batch, the Big E annual wash maintenance of 150, on-call storm cleanup of 30,000, drainage and culvert maintenance, 100,000, street sweeping, 90, uh, a household hazardous waste collection event is $50,000, and that is one of the items that council would like to see implemented. We also added in the cost of what it would do for preparation of a billing, and we estimated $80,000 for that. All expenditures totaling $640,000. At our fee of $3 per month per parcel, $36 a year times 15,000 parcels will add up to $540,000. Since we anticipate implementing this on January 1st, we had to cover the expenses that were going to be incurred in the first six months of this fiscal year. So to do that, we transferred $222,000 from the general fund into our new environmental fund to help cover the cost of that. So our total revenues are 760,000. So there's a recap. I'm showing an excess, but that includes the transfer from the general fund of 222000 and assumes that every parcel will pay their $36 in a timely manner as soon as the bill gets mailed. And I have some doubts that that is a realistic expectation. What we propose to do now going forward is our vendor, who has responded to the RFP, proposes to send out a mailing in November. We will help them draft it. It was to give background to the residents on what and why the fee, and also to introduce our vendor to them so that they can be aware when they receive a bill that it's not junk mail, that it is something that they need to pay attention to. We also hope to contact the Fountain Hills Times and ask them to run a series of informational articles in the paper beginning in December. 
We also are going to prepare an article for inclusion in the winter edition of In the Loop. And then we will hold two public hearing, public outreach sessions here in council chambers during the month of December. So our next step is after this evening's presentation will be to come back next meeting, September 17th, and present to council on their regular agenda the approval for the contract with American Meeting, Metering Services. With that, I'll entertain any questions council members may have. Questions? Councilman Yates. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Thanks, Craig. Um, did the winner of the RFP give you an example of what they're expecting as far as uh, initial response? Uh, one thing that was brought up was because it hadn't been done this way before, how many people will look at it and be like, I'm not doing this, or this may be junk mail, or any number of things? They do not know. Their suggestion that we send out the informa informational mailing will give us some feel for how good our address database is going to be and what kind of return mail we're going to get. So we'll have some time to try to research that. But since it is so brand new, they've not done anything like that. They're typically billing for water or trash services, which has some impact to the residents if they don't pay. Um, they've also asked us what um, we would like to charge for a late fee, and we've told them that council has not authorized any addition of a late fee for non-payment. So it, we're, we're in the dark. We really don't know. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah. Councilman Magazine. Mark, you um, uh, transferring funds from HERF uh, to cover the first six months of operations. I guess I'm not clear on whether or not you expect to recover that money. We do not. Um, it was my understanding, uh, probably incorrect, that we were, in fact, I mentioned this earlier, we were using the rest of the HERF funds uh, for Zone 1 road maintenance. Is how Your how earlier statement was we were transferring monies from the HER fund. That's incorrect. We're transferring monies from the general fund. From the general fund for Zone 1? No. Her, zone 1 pavement management is right. going to be done with HER funds. Okay. All of the environmental fee was done with transfers of monies from the general fund. Well, it says here transfers from the general and HER funds to cover the first six mm -hmm. months. There's a slight cost of employees that are assigned. That cost is going to be, I had it someplace, um, yeah, $23,000 of HERF monies. Oh, okay. All right. I just want one other comment. Um, I hope as we outreach to the public and try to explain this, that we make it exceedingly clear um, that this all originated with the federal government uh, with EPA. It was then handed down to the state, the state then handed it down to the local governments. Uh, I think it's very important that the public understand how this came about. We definitely plan to incorporate all of the required mandatory permits that are now part of the cost of doing business. Thank you. I have a question. Um, seems rather ambitious to think that 15,000 parcels are going to each pay $36. Um, if someone doesn't pay, are we going to turn this over to a collection agency and have them go after somebody for $36? That discussion has been mentioned, and until we see what kind of collection rate we have, I don't know that we'll have any statistics to present to a collection agency for them to gauge whether it would be worth their efforts to try to do that. So for $36... My um, guess is they don't wish to be bothered. And they take and they take a portion of that, correct. of course. So it would seem that we're not going to get all fifteen. We're not going to get all fifteen thousand. I wouldn't expect um, that we did. So what's so what's a recourse for someone? Then the collection agency goes after them, and what do they do to these people for thirty six dollars? I can't answer that. I would look to legal for some advice as to what collection techniques I wouldn't look the legal Andrew will call mayor leans okay well you know I was I was everybody knows that I was against this because 
I don't think we should be charging people $36. I understand that we need the money for this, but I'm looking towards other ways that we're going to be okay, and that's our economic development. That's the way I want to go, and our construction is up, and I, I just think we are just nitpicking people to death here with $36, and then we're going to send a collection agency after them for $36. I mean, what does that say about our town that we want to do that? I mean, for $36, better to ask people to donate $36 out of their goodwill than, than to charge them. And I could see, like, so many people who they don't even get their, they don't even notice their ballots in the mail. How many people got ballots in the mail and thought it was just junk mail and tossed it aside. They just don't do things with paper anymore. Everything's online. They don't look at any of this stuff. So many people are going to not pay this, not because maybe they wouldn't just give us the $36, but they're probably not even going to notice it in their mail. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm still against doing this. And unfortunately, I also think that in the future, this might be an avenue for uh, future councils to raise this and ask for more. Once you open the door and you get this started, it's so easy to do this. So I know this is just information only, but I think that we also discussed having town halls and to not educate people on why they should pay this, but I thought we were going to have town halls to ask people if they wanted this. I wanted to go out to the town halls and say, do you want to pay this? Do you think this is necessary? Would you be willing to pay this? But it sounds like we're putting the cart before the horse, and we've already got this all set up with this company before we even asked anybody. Mayor. So that's why, excuse Sorry. me, Sorry. let me finish. So, so that's why I was opposed to it, and I still am. Councilman Magazine. Well, with all due respect, I couldn't disagree more. We've struggled through the budget. We have tremendous costs that are going to hit us this year that aren't even in the budget. We're talking about somehow raising this amount of money uh, in lieu of any kind of a fee. And it, it's easy to say economic development. And yes, we have increased construction. But that money's being eaten away. It's being eaten away in a number of ways. Um, and it will be. And I mentioned this earlier. We talk about her funds and so on. We talk about the roads. We can't begin to pay for the pavement of our roads. Um, we're already a year behind uh, and half a million dollars behind on Zone 1. Uh, I'm not in favor of taxing people um, unless it becomes absolutely necessary to run this town. And I think that's where we are. It's absolutely necessary that we get more income to run this town. We are seeing cuts in services. We've been seeing it for years. We have shortfalls every single year. Uh, the predict prediction is we're going to have a shortfall bet between now and the year 2019-20 of over $900,000. That doesn't include the reduction in her funds. It doesn't include paying for the roads. It doesn't include for a lot of unknown things. It doesn't include uh, paying for infrastructure changes, infrastructure improvements that you mentioned earlier. Um, none of this is easy, but sometimes you just have to bite the bullet and do these kinds of things. And I'll just clarify something that I said. Um, I want you to ask the residents first because whenever there's a tax involved, I want to get the people to tell me whether they feel that this is important and they want to pay it. Um, I also think it's unfair that Target pays $36 and someone who owns a, 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 small, uh, a small home also pays $36 and someone who owns a really big expensive home pays $36. This is by parcel. So I think that's unfair because there are some people in this town who are living on fixed incomes, and $36 does mean a lot to them. I know people think that we have a rich town, but we have a lot of people that are not doing so well here. And so I think they're going to see that as unfair. Why should a large home pay this? Why should a small home pay this? Why should Target only pay $36? So, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, unfairness there. I would have rather seen some sort of a, even if it was a non-binding referendum on the ballot to ask people if they want it, we should go to the people and ask. And at the very least, we should be having town halls before we sign a contract, because that's just saying to the people, it's already a done deal, so we really don't want your opinion on whether you, this is a good idea or not. We're just going to educate you on why you should pay this. And I, don't, I just don't like 
that way of doing things. Councilman Yates. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Andrew, being that this already passed the council 4-3, what, what are the what ifs? Um, and I know when uh, Councilwoman Hansen asked this to be tabled, she did put in that motion or suggestion to have a series of town halls. I, I realize it was for information, but to the mayor's point, if the feedback comes back and the council wants to um, readdress this issue, what are the de what's the decision tree moving forward? We didn't have a date start or anything. I'm sorry. Go ahead, um, Mayor Councilmember Yates. You know, the, an action of the council is subject to a later action of the council. There's there really is no end date, start date, or anything that is fixed in stone when you're talking about something like this. Um, the uh, the concept of going to the voters to ask for permission for something like this is just not within your authority. You don't have the ability to go and ask the voters to provide a referendum or a, an advisory opinion. That You just can't do it. Only on transportation issues is the only thing that you can do that for. You can't even put a non-binding referendum out no. there. Well, advisory elections are not allowed under Arizona law. You have one statutory carve out and that's for a transportation issue. So if you want to put a transportation question like that on the ballot, that's the only one we can do. So we really don't have the ability to, to get that kind of feedback. Um, but the council's actions are subject to a later council's actions. Yeah, uh, Vice Mayor Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, you know, how quickly we all forget what went on from 2009 through 2013 when there was nothing being constructed and this town was sitting here wondering if we could even pay the light bill. And now that the construction's picking up again, oh my goodness, look here, we've got a little money. And, but how quickly we all forget that this could go away at the bat of an eye. The economy's fragile. Uh, and so let's, let's not get back on the, the shoulders of the developers and builders in this town. We need to start standing on our own. It's time for this town to grow up. And do I like, do I like paying taxes? Absolutely not. But I do like having my buildings that we paid for, cared for, opposed to being shuttered, our roof leaks fixed. I like to see our windows clean. I like to see our buildings maintained. I like to see our washes clean. Wait till one of the little fires rolls down one of our washes and burns down 25, 30 houses because there's no way to stop it because our wash is dirty. You know, there's, there's another side to this coin that it's time for this town to grow up and start paying its own way. And at some point in time, we're, if, if we don't, we will end up being Scottsdale and we'll go to bed one night and wake up the next morning and have a primary tax and a secondary tax and there won't be anything we can do about it. So I think we need to be smarter and start educating the people that we aren't paying for our, our own property at all. We don't pay to drive on our streets. We don't do anything. And it's time that we grow up. Well, I think our residents are smart. And the first time we asked them for a bond for Saguaro before I became mayor, it was a big one, and they said no. And then the second time we presented them with something that made sense, we presented it in the right way with town halls and lots of information, and they did the right thing and they said yes. I just want to give our residents the opportunity to express themselves, and I don't see anything set up for town halls except till after this is all a done deal. Councilman Leger. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I voted against this. Um, I voted against it because I didn't think it was, it was equitable, and the vote was 4-3. So out of respect for the vote of 4-3, although I opposed it, I think we need to look forward and do the best job we can to implement a decision that I disagreed with that was made by a majority. I have a tendency to follow and respect majority votes from, from the DAS. With that being said, when I looked at the contract, Greg, and um, Craig, excuse me, um, there was something in there about pre-notification. Um, it appeared to me that the vendor had already anticipated that um, folks uh, may overlook the bill. Can, can you um, expound on that? I can, Mayor, Councilman Leger. 
um, in the vendor's response, they indicated that this is, since this is a new fee being implemented, they have found from their past experience that notifying the potential people affected by it will increase the understanding of the residents, will also, they will outline for them the methods that they can make payment on this, and they definitely asked us to provide them with background information so that they could include in that informational distribution initially. Thank you for that clarification. I'm, I'm looking forward, that's why I'm asking these questions. I'm not looking forward to the fee, as I said, I was opposed to it, but it was voted on four to three. Uh, there is um, also some indication that, um, well, as you said earlier, there will not be a late fee. We've decided not to do that. Um, the education process. It was my understanding that there was never intention to do a town hall. It was a public discussion on this when it was voted on. The council, once again, 4-3 voted on it. It's my understanding that uh, Councilman um, Hansen wanted this tabled simply to provide an opportunity for you to present to us um, the contract um, situations or any questions we had on it. And furthermore, it was my understanding that the meetings that are being referred to as town hall by the town were simply to educate the um, member, excuse me, the residents on the fact that this is a reality and this is how it's going to be received. Um, one last question. Um, with respect to collecting and working with, with the residents, as difficult as this going to be, and I don't have a great deal of confidence either, I think the contract alluded to a dedicated um, customer service rep. Um, can you expound on that? And will that have maybe a positive effect in terms of working with residents when they get these bills? Uh, Mayor, Councilman Leger, the vendor did offer to provide a dedicated staff of people that would be educated by the town on what the fee is, why the fee is being levied, excuse me, charged, um, and be able in a position to answer questions should the residents call um, and inquire about why do I have this bill, how am I supposed to pay it, et cetera. So there would be someone available that could, could answer those yes. questions and fill those questions. Yes. Okay, thank you. Was there a cost to having a dedicated person answer the phone? I'm sure there was, but it was lumped in as part of their cost of the billing. Okay, and even though we won't be charging a late fee, if someone doesn't pay, the next step is a collection agency, which then goes after the person, and whatever they do is up to that collection agency. Well, our current, current thinking is that we're going to send out one past due notice, and then at that point, depending on how many have not paid, a uh, determination would be made whether a collection agency is appropriate. And collection agencies normally do what they do. They go after whatever. They go after the person. They could put liens on their homes. They, we don't know what they're going to do. But that's all about a collection agency and how they make money. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, I, I still would like to see us um, have some town halls before we sign an actual contract. And I believe that the contract is coming up. Is it our next meeting? It, it, that is correct, Mayor. We have this plan to come back at the next meeting. I would like to see that delayed so that we could at least have some town halls prior to that to show the people that we want to present it to them first and get their opinion and uh, their input on this rather than sign a contract and then ask them because we've already done it. So I don't see any point except to educate people on you have to pay. Mayor. Council Magazine. Can I ask council, um, as I understand it, you're suggesting we have town halls to ask people if they're in favor of it, is that right? Um, I'm asking us to be able to present it to people at a town hall or uh, something where they could come and they could um, discuss it, not like here, because a lot of them still don't even know that this is happening, because they don't really listen to all of our meetings. It, the, the, if I'm wrong, tell me. The implication sounds to me like if, if people come out against it, that therefore it wouldn't be so. 
but there's already been a vote of council. I guess I'm asking, well, I guess the, the, it's already been asked and answered that if we want to change it, there has to be an affirmative vote by council. I'd just like to hear what the people have to say about it. I don't know anything about how the, what the people say, except for people that have stopped me in grocery stores or whatever, and, you know, that's just people that come up to me. I just feel that we should, just like we we're going to have a town hall or something to educate people after the fact, let's do that before we sign a contract. It, it just seems like the right thing to do. Just a point of information, likewise, as Councilman Leger said, we all voted as Councilwoman Hansen suggested a work study session and we all were in favor of that. So that hasn't happened either. So I, nothing, Craig, you've done nothing wrong. You're doing your job. I'm sorry you're standing there taking the brunt end of this. Um, you're not even the collector, so <laughs> you're, you're fine. Uh, to the mayor's point, and, and I do agree that maybe we should collect some more information. Who knows in that, you know, think tank, they may come up with a better way of, of paying the fee other than collect, spend, I'd rather do something besides signing a contract for eighty ninety thousand dollars to to fail. So we did vote on Councilwoman Hansen's motion, and I think it was unanimous, if I'm not mistaken, to at least have a work study session, but uh, I agree. I, why, why are we looking at a contract before Can, we've done that? Council Member Yates, um, that was what was stated, but the, the, the reasoning why she was wanting to do that, she wanted to have a full presentation that would be done publicly. And the staff and I discussed it and we thought, well, what is really what her intent is? And it was really she wanted to be able to, to have the public know more about this. And the concern is with a study session, we do not televise those. And so we thought it would be we get more bang for the buck like at a presentation at a public meeting at a regular council meeting. So that's, that was the purpose of doing that. The other thing is the way that the um, study sessions work with scheduling. We have an issue where um, with this particular vendor, he's already extended the price once beyond what was originally contracted for. Because, I, was it a 60 day? It was originally a 60 day and he agreed to extend it till September 17th. So that is why we are proceeding down this path. Now, let us again reemphasize the fact that we went through and we did a solicitation. We went through and we tried to find all various different types of vendors who would have an interest in this type of uh, activity to support this. We only had one. And so I'm not confident that this vendor will, you know, hold the prices or if we went through a process to, um, you know, have the public go through and give us input on this and, and the council make another decision, we may not be able to do what the council intended a year ago on this. And the other issue is we have budgeted the expenditures in this year's budget with the intent of funding those with this fee. So yet if we don't do that, that's going to cause a budgetary issue this year because we don't have the, the revenues or the wherewithal to actually undertake those, those um, activities. You saw on the list, uh, it was 500 and 40. The expense or the revenue? The expenditures are $639,000. Now we, we realize we're not going to probably collect the full amount of the revenues, which is at 762000 but the point is, we have to do those activities. We're, they're mandated. And so this is, this is the quandary we're in right now. Yeah. Councilman Magazine. We're talking about $3 per month. Um, this strikes me as a classic example of paralysis by analysis. I move approval of the contract. It's not on the agenda. Sorry. Madam Mayor, it's not on the agenda. It's not on the agenda. It's not on the agenda? No. no. This is oh. oh, sorry. This was on work study. Can I, uh, Grady, can I have another question for you? Um, how are you planning on doing after the fact outreach to the people as far as you talked about you want to educate the people afterwards? Well, so, not, it's not afterwards. I mean, it's, it's well, before the billing the, goes out so well, that they know what it is. If the contract comes up next meeting right. and it gets approved, 
Then you said, then we were going to do outreach to the people. Absolutely. So how were you going to do that? So well, we had a plan that was presented to you. We are going to go and one of the things that we're going to do is with the letters that will go out, we will review the letters to make sure that the letters are accurately communicating what this program is all about and really the compelling reason why we're doing this. And then we're also going to try to um, have information that there will be um, some public outreach that they can attend. And I think we can also direct people to our website. We also are going to be working very closely with um, the local paper to try to promote this, um, both the public outreach, but also um, help us explain to the community what is happening and why we're doing this. What kind of public outreach? Well, public outreach is basically uh, having these workshops here um, for people to attend and you know we haven't really settled exactly when I know we're talking about in December but we can actually you know have it at the community center we we've already talked about having it in in the council chamber we could actually go to the schools um, you know we could send out information with the school menus that go out to kids but I think there's a lot of different opportunities that we can do to try to reach people and try to communicate what we're trying to do here. Yeah, I understand, and I think that we should be doing that before we sign a contract. That's just the way I No, I, I, I understand, and I mm -hmm. respectfully hear what you're saying. Okay, so we're not looking for any um, action on this. All right. Uh, thanks, Craig. You're quite welcome. <laughs> um, there was nothing else, right, for Craig or Grady or anybody? <clears throat> All right. Oh, yes? Just real quick, that 650000 of... Uh, Cash flow left over? Did we allocate that? We're just going to carry that over to the next fiscal. We have not done anything with it. It is now still residing in the general fund. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Ma All right. We'll go on to 19, and that's not Craig. Consideration of a cooperative purchase agreement, C2016-145, between MR Tanner Development and Construction Incorporated and the Town of Fountain Hills, for asphalt replacement and miscellaneous work in an amount not to exceed $1,471,597.22. All right, exactly, huh? Miscellaneous. Grady. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, before you tonight is a consideration of a cooperative purchasing agreement that will be uh, taking on and funding the construction of the pavement management area of Zone 1. And just to give you an idea what that will be, um, Paul Mood, our Development Services Director, has a presentation who will go into um, the uh, outline of this project. Okay, uh, Mayor Kavanaugh, uh, Council Members, um, back in 2013, Council approved the pavement management program, which allocated a um, million dollars to the um, payment management program and typically that was really crack seal some type of surface treatment or slurry seal um, as we got to zone one this is our largest and oldest zone in town um, over 700,000 square yards of asphalt um, as just a budget reference um, Slurry seal is about $2.50 a square yard, so you start adding that to 700 plus thousand square yards, that's a lot. So when we got to zone one, um, we found many of the roads we can't even do slurry seal on. They're in such bad shape. Um, I talked to our previous street superintendent, Ken Kurth, and he estimated that um, the last time pavement maintenance was done in this zone was approximately 10 years or more ago. So, um, the normal $1 million a year was not going to be enough. Um, so we're, to Council Member Magazine's point, we are basically wiping out our HERF reserve. We're taking the $1 million um, in payment maintenance, and plus we're taking $500,000 of HERF reserve to be able to go do, in, go do mill and overlay. So what we're going to do is the roads in red are the ones we're going to mill and overlay. We're going to take off approximately an inch and a half to two inches of asphalt and then put new asphalt back, and we're going to hope the subgrade's good underneath. Um, we, do have, we do have some allowances in there, because we had the same issue out on Shea when we did the Shea project. We were before you when we started milling that. It was bad underneath. Um, 
The, um, the roads we're doing are mainly the collector roads. We're, we're doing um, Glenbrook, El Pueblo, Grande. Um, we're doing Fayette. Um, and then part of Pepperwood is really bad and part of Del Cambry is really bad as well. So we're hitting those. Uh, the contract is, if approved, is set to start the second full week in October. We're timing it with the fall break of school so we can do by the, um, the elementary school on Fayette and the, uh, the charter school on El Pueblo. Um, so that gets us kind of year one. So then actually for year two is when we need to go back and then we need to hit um, Bainbridge, um, part of La Montana, and then there's all these little parts around town that uh, around that zone that we identified that need to be cut out. So that's going to take up your other, at least your million dollars for the next year. And then in year three, hopefully there's no more de deterioration. So we'll come back and we'll slurry seal half of zone one, and in year four we're going <coughs> to slurry seal the other half. And then we move on to zone two, which is the downtown area. And that zone's big enough where we're going to be in there two, three, four years, too. And then we also, do, to um, get ready for this project, if council approves it, we did $150,000 worth of um, ADA sidewalk ramp improvements. Because when you mill and overlay a road, you have to go in and make sure all the ramps are up to ADA codes. So... Um, and then we're not going to be back in this zone probably for another 10 years. Mm -hmm. yes. So the red, the red dots, are those spots that you have to do? Those are all, and those, lo, those red dots can be like 50 by 50 or 20 by okay, 20. Those are also sections. Those need to be cut out and asphalt replaced. There, there's so much cracking that you, you can't just put slurry seal over okay. the top of it. Yeah. It would just crack within the next year or two. Question? Yeah. Councilman Magazine. I think we all understand the vagaries of financial forecasting. Um, you've come up with a number, you've come up with an estimate. We're talking about delaying by a full, by one year, uh, which means we're talking about three more years uh, of possible deterioration. Um, You've come up with something in the neighborhood of 50, I think. It was up higher. It was 70 or 80. Now it's like 50 areas where we need to actually... Well, a lot of the areas that we said before are actually covered by... The, we weren't actually planning on milling and overlaying these larger sections, and those wipe out a lot of those small areas. Okay. Um, how, how did you come up with the numbers, and how certain are you? What's the plus or minus here? What, I mean the total cost of zone one over four years? Um, well, fortunately, with MR Tanner, we're actually piggybacking off a $5 million city of Chandler mill and overlay project. Around. They're doing the same thing, but they're doing about $5 million. We're getting a good economy of scale. Um, it's just the, the square yardage we need to do and, and the, what it costs a square yard to mill and overlay or a square yard to uh, slurry seal. Does inflation affect any of this? Over um, it's an oil, yeah, it's an oil price. I'm sorry? Prices of oil. But MR Tanner has a, um, I can't remember if this contract is a three or a five-year contract with Chandler, and then they have, uh, they do have escalation in it. Just about every project I've ever seen, and I'm not, this is not aimed at you at all, every major project I've ever seen always goes over. Very few things go under or hit the mark, and uh, I'd, I'd bet money. I'd give odds that we're not that that, that figure's low. It's going to go up. Um, we're going to find things as we start doing the work. Things will happen. Sure. And then um, uh, what we're using is draining the hearth funds again. There's no money left over for anything else. Um, I don't have an answer. I just find it very troubling. So, Paul, does this amount give you any leeway if you find something? Or um, we, have about, we have about $100,000 in there extra. Mm -hmm. So That's uh, for like one, one pothole, Dennis? Five what percent. Is that? Yeah, it's <laughs> lean and mean. We're hoping there's not a big uh, subgrade issue. Okay. Any other questions for Paul? 
Any speaker cards? No, Mayor. All right, then I'm looking for a motion. So moved. Second. All right. Uh, any other council discussion? If not, all in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Mayor, 6 0. All right. Council discussion or direction to the sound manager? Doesn't look like we have anything. Oh. Um, I'm yeah. sorry, Mayor. Right. Um, our, our new employee left. I was hoping we could introduce him. I apologize, but if you could give him a shout out. Sure. Yes, uh, pleased to announce that our new Administrative Services Director, David Trimble, started on Monday. And uh, it was wise to have him start this week versus next week, because I think if he started on a payroll week, he may not have wanted to come back. So, <laughs> But he's a great guy, a good catch. Um, he has been the Director of Administration for the State Land Department. Um, he had some really excellent references and some really excellent um, background that I think is going to be a really good fit for the organization. So I think all of us are very pleased with having him on board. Do you think next meeting he could come and introduce himself? I, I would be happy to. That'd be great. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Uh, any summary of council requests, reports on recent activities, anything anybody needs to say? If not, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for hanging in there with us. Bye.